guys, welcome to our channel. Welcome to our homestead. My name is Aaron. My wife, Rachel, and I have four kids and a five acre farm here in Northern California. Uh, today we're part of a collaboration with Squeaky Tree Homestead and a few other channels uh, to talk about how we would start a homestead in 2022. It's kind of an interesting question because we're not a traditional homestead in any way, shape, well, in a shape or form. You know, when I think of a, like a real, real homestead, it's like Ma and Pa Ingalls. I don't think you really need to live off grid and sew your own clothes to call yourself a homesteader. You can have that spirit of homesteading in an apartment. You can have a half an acre, you can have a hundred acres, you could have a thousand acres and still have this like varying degree of being a homesteader. Don't ever get that block of, but I'm not really a homesteader because I don't do this. It doesn't matter, just do it, just do what's okay for you, okay? <laughs> so in that spirit, make sure you check out the links below the other channels and go show them some love. We've already checked them all out. If you are looking for gardening, raising animals, good family fun, good clean entertainment. Any of these channels are gonna fit those needs for you. And so go watch their videos, tell them four kids on a farm sent you and uh, give them a thumbs up. So this video is how we would start a homestead in 2022. There's a lot of improvements that we already need on our homestead. And like I said, our homestead's not a traditional homestead. I have a job off farm. I work at a hospital here locally. Right now, Rachel is with our oldest son, AJ, out at his morning scripture study. So I've got the three kids here. I'm gonna make breakfast and then we're all gonna go out and feed our animals. of homesteading these aren't homegrown because our potatoes aren't ready but these things are a game changer if you're wanting to make a quick breakfast um, and the kids are Let's see one right there say hi Laura hi. wave oh and there's another one <laughs> still in their blankets still trying to wake up so yeah. and there's the third one Okay, breakfast is accomplished. It's time to take care of some chores. Time to let these guys out. <clears throat> To the pond. <laughs> the things about ducks is they lay anywhere under there. Ducks are one of the funnest but dirtiest animals on our farm. Uh, they haven't made it to the pond yet because they think uh, Kate and Brixton have food for them, but they free range in our pastures. We love them to death. We get asked the question all the time, what animal should I start with first? Probably not ducks. I think uh, for the most part, if you're starting a homestead, if you're dreaming a homestead, chickens needs to be number one on your list. It just, their value for the farm, for food and for manure and for, you know, bug prevention and stuff like that is it, just second to none. Chickens are fantastic. 
or use some chickens. We always order our chickens through McMurray Hatchery. Actually, all of our poultry, our ducks, our geese, our turkeys, all come from McMurray Hatchery. You have my permission to get whatever poultry your heart desires. There you go. It's coming from me. You can blame it on me. Just make sure that you're up to the task of taking care of them, okay? I'm not gonna take responsibility for your poultry indulgences if you can't take care of those poultry. So one thing I absolutely hate about our homestead, if I'm gonna pick on myself, uh, but this is how the homestead came, okay? Is the fencing is horrendous. There are places on our farm, on our five acres, that has three different types of fencing. And the people who were here didn't replace it, they just added another fence on it. And so anybody who has done fencing, you know it's back breaking work. It takes the right equipment, it takes a lot of people, and it takes a lot of money to set up right. Replacing this fencing is a lot of investment. And if we were to start all over again with a blank slate, having strong perimeter fencing on a homestead super important um, and then you know cross fencing uh, is, is expensive but it's also really really nice we rotate all of our animals and I would love to have I have these dreams of like when I watch shows in the UK and they have just these like stone walls and these pastures that are separated by hedgerows and stuff like that that would be fantastic that rooster is trying to prove something that takes money and time and decades. So I wanna show you how we solve that problem with electric fencing. Um, it's, it's mobile, it's pretty cheap. Entry point is pretty cheap and it works for every single one of our animals. As you can see, every single one of our animals gets the electric fence treatment. When you think about fencing per square foot, electric fencing you can use over and over again in multiple spots. And it's just so valuable to be able to rotate our animals. I don't think we could homestead in these modern days uh, without it. I mean, it's just, it is one of the technologies that everybody should add to their farm. One thing that's a total game changer if you're starting a homestead in 2022 is electric fencing. Rotating your pastures with animals with electric fencing is the way to go. These are solar electric fences from Premier One. We also have some solar electric fence from Gallagher, um, which is a New Zealand company. We will put links to both of those below. But this has really allowed us not to overgraze one spot in our pasture. And, and, and basically every animal on our farm gets the electric fence treatment, except for our goats, because our goats <laughs> seem to be too smart for it. We've kind of just have cattle panels around our goats, but otherwise pigs, sheep, chickens, turkeys, cows. Did I miss anything? they all have some sort of electric fence. Electric fence is a psychological barrier, meaning that a pig, of course, can run straight through their fence, but they won't because they've got those wet little noses. I've touched the electric fence multiple times. It scares you, hurts a little bit, it is not enough jewels to be able to do anything to to harm an animal. Whatever animal you have on an area does so much good to that pasture. They poop on it, the chickens, they scratch on it, the pigs, they dig it up a little bit, till it a little bit, and they leave their manure and their pee, which ends up leaving the grass greener the next time that they're rotated around. 
The one downside of electric fencing is it's really not a one person job. It really takes a few people to do it fast and efficiently. But like this one stretch of fencing, if I wanted to, I could do it by myself. It would just take a little bit of time. The other thing, and Joel Salatin recommends this, is keep all of your animals mobile. So this is the mobile chicken coop that we built. Um, I'm working on a video for this. Uh, I still haven't come up with a name for it. On TikTok, people are calling it the uh, pasture prowler, uh, the chickmobile, um, the chicken chariot, stuff like that. So if you have an idea of what we should call this guy, uh, put it in the comments below. Having your chicken coop mobile makes it able to be used anywhere on your property. We do have a fixed chicken coop right there. Those are, that's where all of our egg layers go. It limits how far we could move them. These guys I could put in my backyard. I could put them over on the west side of our pasture. I can move them behind the cows to eat the larva in the cow poop. And that's something that Joel Salatin and uh, people like Justin Rhodes recommend um, to, to reduce pest pressure. Moving an animal from one space to another gives them a clean area, a fresh area. And by the time you go throughout your whole property and come back to that place again that they first started, you're gonna have greener grass. There's gonna be less pests. It really is the standard for animal health and pasture health. If you're thinking of starting a homestead, make the investment in electric fencing. You won't regret it. It makes life a lot easier. And we got the hammer. So we'll show you how we move this guy. It's fantastically easy. Um, we got the hay dolly. We'll put that on the hooks in the front. We'll move it just that way. And we'll give our uh, chickens a, a little new space. Shower time, I want you to tell me if you think they like it. This is another thing we definitely need to work on is water infrastructure. We're using like 100 foot hoses. It gets a little cumbersome. It would be really, really nice to have some trenches dug and irrigation everywhere. Uh, that costs money though. And so we've got to wait for the right time that we're able to do that. It's getting hotter for the pigs. They need a wallow. Um, you know, they need constant water and things like these cement buckets aren't doing it. So I'm going to have to brainstorm a little bit and make something mobile, a mobile water, like a, a barrel and a nipple water or something like that. Okay. Waters are full. Pigs are wet. saying nothing happier than a pig in mud or something like that if they really really like it keeping our pastures green in summer is near impossible we would love to do it it would save us on hay so if you guys are starting a homestead water infrastructure is so important uh, to making your chores easier 
your animal's life happier and healthier. And uh, that's one thing that we do have to work on here either this year or next year. So maybe the question too is like, like what actually is a homesteader? And you know, like, what's a homesteader? What's a hobby farm? What's a farm farm? What's a ranch? Um, so this is from Google. Homesteading is a vernacular term for a lifestyle of self-sufficiency. It is characterized by subsistence agriculture, home preservation of food, and may also involve the small scale production of textiles, clothing, and craft work for household use or sale. You know, you can identify as a homesteader and not have a thousand acres of land. This spirit of homesteading, even though we may not be a traditional homestead, is uh, is like in our everyday lives. You know, our garden has changed dramatically how we grow food because we want to be a little bit more sustainable, self-sufficient, and we want to have our grocery store in our backyard. You know, the way we treat the land, the way we're stewards of the land um, has changed based on like how we try to be self-sufficient here on our homestead. So whatever step you are, whatever like notch in that scale you are of a homesteader, just know that it goes forward. Like it gets better and it gets bigger and nobody has to tell you to stop. You're an adult and you can do whatever you want. Well, look who finally showed up. <laughs> what? Over. Just when we start talking about gardening, she decides to be ready for this. I'm all about gardening. Yeah, I know. Listen, we're gonna go, we're gonna take you on a tour of our garden. Um, I'm all about food. She's all about flowers. And I like food. I like food. But it's true. The food plots that I had prepared for my veggies have turned into flower plots. And that, that kind of, I like, I say it in jest, that was kind of a necessity because of, we, we just got this huge volume of like the stupidest flower on the planet, the Lysianthus, like I hate them to death. <laughs> but as we go in the garden, we just want to talk about like, our philosophy of how we garden has changed. When we started, like what, what did our first garden look like? Oh gosh. It's horrendous. We started out in these little plastic soil bags, which is super pitiful. It was so I think I saw that on Pinterest and that's why I tried it. I was like, oh, this is fun. <laughs> no. No, don't. Don't do it. Well, but... I wouldn't say don't do it. <laughs> do what makes you happy. <laughs> do, what, do what makes you feel comfortable. Uh, you know, because shame on us if we told you never ever do that and somebody else does it and is super success successful with it. You know, yeah, we just, that's true. we can't be the judge of where everybody lives and what everybody does. And so, you, you know, do you. that's the beauty of homesteading is like everybody needs different adaptations to where they live, whether they're raising chickens so or whether they're raising goats or pigs or they have a garden. You do you. If somebody saw our garden and criticized it, you know, shame on them, right? Because like, we didn't know what we're doing. Like nobody becomes a fantastic gardener from the beginning. So we guys, we, we want to give you guys some encouragement there as well. Like your gardening journey is gonna be long and hard and full of weeds but eventually you'll start growing stuff and you'll be proud of yourself. So gardening is, uh, it's a lifetime thing. It's like, there's not just one season. You're always gonna be learning. You're always gonna be growing. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. you're always gonna be evolving. You're always gonna be changing. Our, our philosophy of gardening has changed a ton where in the beginning we kind of got like the 
boutique -y fun things. And the, the fun seeds are great. You know, the, the butterfly peas, the blue tomatoes. Um, but our philosophy has changed. And the, and the self-sufficiency part has kind of driven us to have more of what we use all the time and less of just the like boutique -y thing that we can have in our salad on the weekend, you know? So when we grow cucumbers, we want cucumbers to pickle, to have fresh, and it's changed the varieties that we choose for those things like tomatoes. We want tomatoes fresh to be able to can. So our goal is to have our list of groceries shrink and shrink um, so that our groceries mostly come from our backyard. By the end of this year, all of our animal proteins can come from our farm. And that's gonna end with our beef cow uh, that we'll butcher this year. So pork, turkey, chicken, eggs, milk, all of that is gonna come from all of it comes, like all of our it comes. five acres, yeah, which is crazy. So far, we're like 80% self-sufficient with our meat. It's, Proteins, it's amazing yeah. uh, and it's delicious and it's nutritious. And that's our goal with our garden. Like the only thing we may not have to get from the store is like wheat. Yeah, we definitely not going around. Is that crazy? <laughs> so in the beginning, we started out with like those 12 count seed trays. And now it's like exploded to our trays are like 162 count and we have indoor lights. Kind of overwhelming when we think about it because we start seeds for our flower farm and our garden every single week. So this is our setup. Um, we switched over like he was saying to like these big fat trays. These are Haas trays, we love them. They're 162 count and they're like heavy, heavy duty. Um, we actually had our kids jump on them just to see how heavy duty they were. We'll start a set of seeds and then we'll put them on the line. And guys, look it, not everything is gonna germinate. We're trying to get better at that, but um, some of these are not all the way germinated. But what we'll do, we'll put the first thing that we've started and we'll just set it here and then we'll continue like the next tray that we start and then the next tray and the next tray. So then when we're planting out, we can just pick up the first tray and be ready to plant it. So that's kind of like what I'm doing to keep track of everything. Um, I should write dates on the plants <laughs> on the side, but I don't. So we're growing a ton of tomatoes this year because one of the goals we have is to can a bunch of tomatoes. We use tomatoes in everything, you guys. like from spaghetti sauce to um, Indian food and just it's a filler for soups like for everything and so um, we have a bunch of Haas tomatoes that we started. We love Haas just because they have like a high germination rate. They're such a good company. Um, we do work with them and so we just love them and so that's one of the goals is to have canned tomatoes down the road. So wish us luck on that because that's a new adventure. We haven't like canned tomatoes like this. I haven't personally, like my mom's done it. Have you done it? I've canned tomatoes, yeah. Yeah, Aaron's done it, but I want to personally do it, so anyway. And then there's, these are peppers, right? Those are peppers, yeah. And then we've got peppers here. Jalapenos mostly. Yeah. They're not doing fantastic. Yeah, I think they have a little too much water, I don't know. They'll do. So I don't know if this is kind of a weird exercise, but write down 10 things that you mostly go to the store for, uh, you know, vegetable wise. If you could grow it in your backyard, it's gonna be healthier, it's gonna be more nutritious, it's gonna last longer. You don't have to question what it was grown in. I mean, you know all those things. Do you have to grow every ounce of food for you, you to be called a homesteader? No. And that's so true. It's like bloom where you're planted, right? Like you guys have the opportunity to start a garden in your backyard or to start in whatever small space you have. And you don't have to grow every single thing like Erin's saying, you can just pick 10 things that you want to start growing. What was I gonna say? 
Um, Rachel <laughs> gets a little shy in front of the camera, okay? But she is the hardest worker. She's the most genuine person I know. If you guys were here with us, we would have this conversation so comfortably about how you can do it like you just have to start. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so you put her on the spot and she's just like, yeah. Um. <laughs> he loves uh, Don't let fear stop you. You guys can grow something beautiful. You're going to learn so much by just starting a seed, learning how it germinates, learning how it grows, watching what it does, and planting it in the ground, and just watching. So my encouragement to you is you can do it. So follow the link in our notes for Hostel Seeds. You could get a free pack of seeds. There's like 50 tomato seeds in there. You have 50 chances to grow a tomato <laughs> That's true. for like $2.99, okay? But you get it for free and buy some other seeds and just try that out. Make some mistakes. You're going to have some successes, we promise. Um, you know, we would give you some of our tomatoes if you were here. <laughs> we have so many. Uh, a whole row or two of our garden is going to be tomatoes. You ask me if I'm sick of tomatoes in August. I, uh, canning and you all that stuff. You won't be sick of it. This is hard work but it is worth the effort. It is so satisfying to have your own fresh food in your garden, to have your own food on your table, feeding your kids the healthiest, most nutritious, delicious food on the planet. You can't buy it, you gotta grow it. And you know what's fun too is, like we'll sit down at the dinner table and we'll pull the catalogs out. This is one of my favorite things. And we'll be like, what do you want to grow with the kids? And they'll pick something. Like one of our guys, he likes salsa. And so he picked like a salsa garden. Like we have to have tomatoes and onions and all the things. So get your kids involved because that, that changes how they eat too. So that's one of the biggest reasons to grow a garden. They, they get out there in the garden and they see it and they taste it and they pick straight from the garden and it's beautiful. So they learn that too. So... I say so a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to show you our garden so far this year. And like I said, a lot of it is flowers. Part, part of our idea here on the farm is to have an economy to have our farm pay for itself. And Rachel has wanted a flower farm forever. It took a while for me to get on board with it. It took me a long time because flowers. He's like, there's why. Like, I don't know if you can call a flower farmer a farmer, but that's not true. One of the things uh, in that, that homesteading creed is making your land better and pay for itself. So, we are starting a regenerative flower farm this year, which. It's like, exciting! We already have enough to do. This is already hard enough. So let's just give ourselves something more. But the idea behind the flower farm is eventually it'll be our jobs. Like we will have a flower farm. Like I could, I could retire. <laughs> You'll retire. <laughs> from my job and Rachel will run the flower farm. Oh, and okay. I'll sit in a comfy chair in the living room. The idea is to bring our business home to have our kids be part of our business. Social media is part of it. The flower farm is part of it. And then uh, raising and selling meat is part of it. So we're excited. It is a lot of work. If you, any business owners out there, you know, any farmers know, I've never worried so much about the weather <laughs> Oh yeah. in my life. It we're was like, just like, eh, rain, oh. fine. Sure, I could turn on the sprinklers. <laughs> Now it's like, uh, there's four days of frost coming, there's rain coming, there's no rain coming. Cover How the do beds. we irrigate? Uncover, yeah. uncover the beds. Oh my gosh. It's, it's a lot. It's a little bit of stress. So treat your farmers nice. Yeah. Get to know your farmer. Like seriously, they- Pay them what they're worth. So yeah, pay them what they're worth because they're out there breaking their backs. Some of them, it's their only income. And it is, it is so important, especially with like, I don't know, just, 
Be nice to your farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Be Without nice farmers, to your there's farmer. no food. Yep. Without farmers, you automatically have to become your own homesteader. Here, the idea of this whole tour is just to show you what we're growing now. This is a Ruth Stout style potato garden, meaning we use mulch to cover the potatoes and hopefully decrease weeds because we have an insanely difficult time with Bermuda grass. Oh, this raised bed, like I can't get rid of it. Like we're gonna have to like burn it <laughs> and start with new soil. We don't want to spray, we leave chemicals yeah, we don't do that. out of our garden because we get, to, we get to choose that. We get to affect how our food is grown. So you see the little potato plants coming up though? They're looking so good, right here. Those are Viking potatoes, the ones that are sprouting up right there. Yeah, Viking. So, you know, that's that's one of the things that we're growing so we don't have to get it from the grocery store. Another thing, here is this insanely long bed of onions. This is a year's worth of onions for us. There's probably 200 onions there. It's fantastic. We, it's fantastic. Look at that. Like, <laughs> it's fantastic. Once the tomatoes are going and that's going, we need cilantro and jalapenos. And we've got salsa. We've got fresh salsa. <laughs> oh, that's the every best. single day. Fresh salsa, you guys. Leave in the comments. Do you love fresh salsa? I don't think anything can get better than fresh salsa. Yeah, a good pico de gallo. Oh yeah. Mm. Pitiful beds. Uh, these are ranunculuses. Don't For, be ranunculus. I don't know why they're not doing very well. No. We've gotten uh, some really crazy weather here in California. I think it's like the heat fluctuation. Yep, it gets warm, it gets cold. I know everybody has those problems, but... And that's another thing. Some years when you're gardening, you're going to have like a bumper crop, right? And then other years, you're not going to get a single anything. This is our garlic. So this is uh, elephant garlic, and these are uh, red Russian garlic. All these white sheets are the covers for frost. Yeah. For some dumb dumb reason I can't keep the cats out of here. Like yeah. look at they they just love this Stinker carrot bed. bed. Um, I don't know what to do about it. Yeah. You guys but at have least I don't know. we'll have some carrots. <laughs> um, and then we got our lettuce bed. Which, once again, it didn't start out doing very well, but now it's doing fantastic. Yeah, it's doing really good. Uh, we need to start some more uh, lettuce? lettuce, by the way. Yeah. yeah, we should do that today. I'm starting lettuce and cucumbers. Lettuce is one of the things that we feel like we should never have to buy from the store. Salad's really, really easy to grow. And one of the things I want to start doing this year is microgreens. Ooh. Um, we got some microgreen trays, so like, you know, there's the micro lettuce and sunflower shoots and pea shoots and stuff like that. You can all grow that inside. Um, the rest of this is Lysianthus. All these rows. <laughs> it's his favorite. The dumbest flower <laughs> on the planet. We had a lot of trouble with that. Our, our dog, before we put up this Fort Knox fence around our garden Lily kept getting in and just would like tunnel through the garden like yeah. a gopher it's, um, it's because of the fertilizer we put like yeah. this organic like blood meal fertilizer in it and so it just smelled so good to her so good. she just wanted to roll in it so you have dogs be careful about that we have uh, those Really, really green rows, those are all cover crops. So that is where uh, the seeds we start today, cucumbers, squash, uh, and things like that is gonna go. We're gonna mow that down, uh, get the BCS in here and get the harrow in there and like mix up the dirt and get it all ready uh, for, for actual food, not flowers. So these are our cover crop beds. There's hairy vetch and rye in there. So, that is, though. yeah, it is, uh, cover, beautiful. Sorry. Cover crops are super good for your soil. 
So hairy vetch adds nitrogen to the soil. If, if you're new to cover cropping, you know, in between crops, there's certain plants that you can put in that will add root structure and nutrients and uh, weed suppression uh, to your soil in between those crops. And th those are called cover crops. Uh, buckwheat, sun hemp, hairy vetch, rye, you know, all those things have a purpose. Um, and you know, for our garden, we, we like the nitrogen fixing that legumes do like clover and hairy vetch. You got to think of the soil as a bank. When you grow a crop like corn, it takes that nitrogen and nutrients out. How are you going to put that stuff back in? And cover crops really, really help with that. When you're gardening, you want to also think like you're, you want to feed your soil. So yeah, this is such a big help to that. Yeah, so all of this is ready to go. So I've got one more chore to add to my <laughs> list of chores. So that's our garden. We do have two other plots that we'll be planting flowers in. We've already started on the west side. Um, sunflowers and zinnias. zinnias. Warm and, season crops. Yep, and we're going into those warm, tender annuals, right? Is that what you call them? Yeah. The cup flowers that, that we'll, we'll bring to market here, trying to make Mother's Day. Trying? We have to make Mother's Day. What you Mother's talking Day. about, Willis? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> we have to make it. <laughs> we don't have a choice. We don't. To sum up, a homestead is whatever you make it. It's going to be whatever works for you and your family. But the essence of being a homesteader is growing for self-sufficiency, being sustainable, being a good steward, and, and learning how to grow your own food. The other thing I would add on there is learning to be part of a bigger community than yourself because nobody is going to make it by themselves. Um, having friends and family and taking what you have and spreading it out to others, whether that's the zucchinis that you drop off at church or whether that's inspiring somebody else by them coming to your place and seeing what you do, that's gonna make a bigger difference than just you growing for yourself. Yeah, isn't that what it's all about? It's like, I mean, speaking of community, when we go and we learn from different people, like it's, it's such a big, it has such a big impact on us. We're like, oh yeah, we can do this. So having community is definitely a big thing. Sure, you'll, you'll see it. We go, we go to homesteading conferences all the time. And the question might be, why are these Californians coming to Oklahoma <laughs> and to Virginia and to Tennessee? And it's because we love the people we meet there and we love the things we learn there. Homesteaders of America, Sean and Kevin putting together the Oki Homesteading Expo, I, it was just great. Like every minute of that time was a learning experience and a chance to uh, like increase the size of this community, which is fantastic. There is such a fire with so many people right now to get into this kind of lifestyle and it's a hard lifestyle. I will not sugarcoat it. It is hard work. It's such hard work, but it is so rewarding to grow your own food, to know where your food comes from. And we just, I, if you would have asked me years ago if I was gonna homestead, I'd be like, Psh, whatever. You would not see me out there petting on a pig or birthing a goat like ever in my life. Like. Give me my Lulu pants and let me go work out. I'm totally fine with that. But now it's like, it's completely changed, changed me. So it's a beautiful life. It's a lot of early mornings, a lot of late nights, a lot of dirt under your fingernails. Yeah. Lots of allergies, <laughs> lots of wrestling, but it's worth it. We love it and we wouldn't change anything for that. We look back at our life five years ago and we're so happy where we are now even though we are doing so much more work. Thank you guys for being part of our homestead. We appreciate you guys taking the time and effort it is to listen to this big goofball. <laughs> it's Rachel's easy on the eyes. Oh, I'm, whatever. 
a big hairy weirdo. If you're at the point you're just dreaming of homesteading, or if you've got a little garden plot, keep going, don't stop. We would change some things here if we had five years that we could undo and start again. Yeah, we would start things differently, but there's something so cool about having a blank slate, just a project and working on that and then looking back and seeing the progress that you've made. So our tips were given you of how we would homestead in 2022. <laughs> this, this happens every single time it, without fail. Super rudely interrupted by the neighbor's garbage guy. That happens more than you would think. Something flies over, an animal starts making noise. You know, our advice is gonna be different than everybody else's advice. And so do what feels good. Don't run faster than you have strength. I think that's good advice. But make sure that you have the goal that you are producing food for yourself and for others. That you're becoming more self-sufficient that you're gonna be a good steward on the land, that you're gonna take care of it and leave it better. And make sure that you have goals to make your homestead an economy because it is expensive. But it's a very good economic learning opportunity if you've got kids selling eggs by the roadside, helps pay for feed. And it helps them to learn the value of money and hard work. And so that's homesteading in a nutshell. That's why we do it, because we want to raise our family doing these things. And so as you go to the other channels and watch their videos, learn from them, and then take the little nuggets that you like and add it to your little basket of information. And pretty soon, as you homestead and farm and grow a garden, you'll have those tips and tricks to give to other people as well. Thank you guys for being part of our channel today. We hope you subscribe. We hope you like this video. Leave us a kind comment and we'll see you next time.